In the book, I was trying to explain the history of the Shiite legal system and to compare it with the Sunni legal system and to explain how it was related. Um, this was addressing a problem that I saw in uh, the study of Islam in general. Generally, Shiite studies have been undertaken by by Shiites or people who were specialists in Shiism and they try to explain everything from an internal perspective um, using explanations that did not look outside of Shiism. Uh, the scholars who wrote on Islam in general and Sunni scholars tended to ignore Shiism completely or to uh, refer to it only with regard to certain topics like the caliphate. Right? So I set out to study Shiism within uh, Islamic, uh, the history of Islamic law in general and to see what that told us. Uh, the book is Islamic Legal Orthodoxy, 12 or Shiite Responses to the Sunni Legal System. This was my dissertation, which I finished at the University of Pennsylvania in 1991. It was published eventually in 1998 at the University of Utah Press in Salt Lake City. The, the basic idea is this, that Shiites, for most of Islamic history and in most situations were a minority within the majority community. In general, the situation of being a minority has particular effects on a community. That community tends to be influenced by the majority in particular ways. That doesn't mean that they necessarily have to agree with the majority on things, but it affects how they agree or how they disagree with the community. You can see this in many other situations in the world. The Jews living in Europe end up, uh, end up conforming to or being influenced by Christian practices, whereas Jews living in North Africa and the Middle East end up being influenced by the surrounding society. So just a very clear example is that in Europe, Jews accepted the restriction of marriage to monogamy, that it was uh, recognized as a rule that you can only have one wife after a certain point in medieval Jewish history in Europe, whereas Middle Eastern Jews continued to have polygamy as a possibility, that you could have more than, than one wife, and it seems clear that this was due to the surroundings. If you look at Jewish celebrations like Hanukkah, for example, many of the practices that you have at Hanukkah, especially the children get gifts, seem to be have developed because of Christian Christmas. And you could give many examples from the Islamic world. It seems that the celebration of the Prophet's birthday was also affected by the celebration of Christmas by, Jew, by Christians in Islamic lands. And the idea that you have a pulpit resembles a uh, Christian practice. The, but it doesn't mean that, that uh, it's always in agreement. So for example, uh, why is the uh, main prayer on Friday? It seems that Friday was chosen specifically because the Jewish tradition had marked uh, Saturday as the main holy day. The Christians had marked Sunday as the main holy day, even though they call it the Sabbath, which still means uh, Saturday. So um, there are many, many examples of this. And if you look at the history of Shiite law, there are many indications that there were intense uh, bouts of influence uh, from, from Sunni law. And the, overall, the system uh, that developed within 12 or Shiite Islam looks very much like Sunni, Sunni, the Sunni legal system in many ways. And if you just do a survey of legal writings from the beginning until uh, from, say, you know, 
uh, 800, 900 until, until the present, you see that many of sim similar developments happened and that often the Shiite developments are a little bit later than similar developments within Sunni Islam. So if you look at the main hadith books in the Sunni canonical hadith books were, were written from the early to mid 9th century up until about the end of the 9th century. The Shiite hadith books were put together between the 10th century and the early 11th century. If you look at manuals of Asul al-Fiqh, it's very clear now that the Sunnis had manuals of Asul al-Fiqh from the late 9th century on, and Shiite, you have Shiite manuals from about a century later or at the earliest about uh, the middle of the 10th century on, and there are many examples where, where similar developments happen just a, a little bit later. And the question for me was, why was this happening? How was it happening? And I tried to explain some of that in the book. Um, I can give a short synopsis of how that works. The, in the introduction of the book, I laid out the general problem, which was that uh, one, it's not very clear how Shiite Islam fits into the, the general system of Islamic law, especially because uh, Shiism is generally recognized as relying on the authority of the Imam, which would indicate that they don't really need the whole Islamic legal system. That is obviously quite important now. So there's a historic shift in Shiism from the authority of the present Imam to a system in which legal scholars have authority and are very important in determining what the religion uh, consists of. So uh, that's a somewhat difficult of a change to explain and it seems to be counterintuitive when you read the statements in the Shiite tradition about the authority of, of the Imams, which is still there and which are still very, very important. So the second chapter is called Islamic Legal Orthodoxy, and this is about the rise of the institutions of Sunni legal schools. Right? This happened at a particular time in history happened say between 900 and 1100 of the common era. It's very clear that uh, institutions came into being that were, that claimed authority and that claimed to be exclusive. And they ended up becoming very, very influential and succeeding in excluding uh, people and scholars who did not belong to the legal schools from the determination of what is correct belief in, in Islam. So we, we knew this for a long time, but it began uh, to be more uh, specifically explained and the process by which it came into being by George Muktasi, by Christopher Melcher, a number of other scholars who looked at the Sunni madhabs. We can tell that this system not only it was successful, and by being successful, it forced uh, other uh, scholars in society to change their behavior in certain ways in order to fit in. So for instance, if you look at Al-Jahiz and you ask what was his legal school, he would have told you that he has no need of a legal school because he is a theologian and he is superior to the jurists and he doesn't need them to you know, teach him in order for him to say something about, about the religion. But once you get to the late 10th century, the major theologians all belong to some legal school. So Al-Khadi Abdul-Jabbar, even though he's a great theologian, the greatest Mu'tazili theologian of his time, he belongs to the Shafi'i Madhab, it's very clear. And after his time, it's very difficult for someone to be a theologian and not to have a, a legal school. The same goes for Sufis, the same goes for Hadith experts, etc. One needed to belong to a legal school if one wanted to say anything authoritative about the religion. So this suggested to me that the Shiites in 
uh, their situation as scholars, especially in Boyhood Baghdad, right, in Baghdad in the late 10th and early 11th century, were under pressure to conform to the Sunni system in order to uh, maintain their authority as, as uh, scholars of religion. That, that there was a pressure for them to, to somehow deal with this new system. In the book, I tried to explain the reactions to the system in three ways. Right? And I characterized them by using the concept of consensus. Right? The system of legal madhabs was based on the concept that the qualified legal scholars had the prerogative to have their opinions uh, taken into account in legal discussions. When they agreed on a matter, it would be accepted as orthodox, and this was called consensus. And when they disagreed on a matter, their opinions would be taken into account, and their various opinions would be considered one of the, some of the possible answers to the legal, legal question. If they were not legal scholars, and had not had a recognized legal education, then their opinions could not be taken to, into account. And if they went against the, other, the legal scholars' opinions, that would be considered a violation of the consensus, which meant that they would be considered heretics. Because, so this was somehow the rule by which people were excluded from the system, or particular opinions were, were excluded from uh, orthodoxy. I divided the Shiites' reactions into three types, and, and the situation did not force them to react in one way, but once you decided to react in one way, it had to be framed within parameters that fist, fit the system. So the first reaction I described in chapter three, which I called conformance to consensus. In this chapter, I argued that Shiite jurists have a tradition of participating in one of the Sunni madhabs, right? especially the Shafi'i madhab, and this is a way for them to get a legal education in a society dominated by Sunnis, to participate in the discussion of religious topics, right? and to have their opinions considered in the general discussion. There is a tradition uh, of Shiite jurists studying with Sunni jurists, especially, especially in the Shafi'i legal school, and it includes some of the most famous legal thinkers in the history of Shiite Islam, especially Al-Alam Al-Hilli, uh, who died in 726 Hijri, 1325 of the Common Era, Shahid al-Awwal, who died in 786 Hijri and 1384 of the Common Era, uh, al muhaqqiq al-Karaki, who died in 940, 1534 of the Common Era, and Shahid al-Thani, who died in uh, 965 or 1558 of the Common Era. All of those scholars studied extensively with Sunni teachers, including in doctrinally marked topics, and including specifically Islamic law, and they went on to make major contributions to Shiite legal, legal history. One thing that I did not have in the book that I would now add, there's sort of an extra chapter to this, for a time, roughly in the 10th century, the late 9th century and the 10th century, there were a number of Shiite scholars who were involved with the Zahiri method. Right. The Zahiri Madhab was founded by Daoud al-Zahiri, who died in 270, 884 of the Common Era, and uh, a number of Shiites were attracted to this Madhab because they focused on the scriptural texts, and they, they emphasized the exclusion of all rulings that were not based closely on the scriptural texts, they did not want to accept any principles that came from outside the scriptural texts. However, this madhab was somewhat short-lived. It died out in the 11th century, and, and it seemed that 
the Shiites who adopted this, this madhab uh, stopped doing so and then the trend came to be to adopt the Shafi'i madhab instead. And, and I would argue that Al-Mas'udi, a famous historian wh who most people know from his book Muruj al Dahab, was a jurist. He wrote a number of legal works. He was a Twelver, clearly. He engaged in Mu'tazili theology, but I'm convinced now that he was a Dahiri uh, jurist and wrote works as a Dahiri jurist. The second type of reaction was to create a Shiite legal madhab to be parallel, it was designed to be parallel with the Sunni madhabs. It's something like a civil rights movement. You know, it's a, arguing for the rights of Shiites to be equal and on a par with their Sunni counterparts. So this process uh, was undertaken mainly in Boyhid Baghdad and mainly by the three great jurists of Baghdad, the Sheikh al-Mufid, the Sharif al-Murtada, and the Sheikh al-Tusi, right, who died in 1022, uh, 1036 and 1067, respectively. They wrote the major works on the law. They, uh, Atusi wrote two of the major canonical hadith works. They wrote uh, the first works that, uh, the first major works on usul al fiqh in the Shiite tradition. And they established uh, uh, an institution of Shiite legal study that survived from boyhood times really until, until today. The third type of reaction that I talked about was re the rejection of consensus. And I talked about the Akhbari movement, which was quite a bit later in the 17th century. And I described it as an anti-madhab movement, that the Akhbaris uh, are, are well known for rejecting ijtihad as a principle, but I argued that you could also look at their movement as a, as a way, as a type of rejection of the institution of the Shiite legal school as it had developed, modeled on the Sunni legal school, and the Shiites were re rejecting the borrowing from Sunni tradition, rejecting uh, the incorporation of the uh, Sunni genre of usul al-fiqh into uh, a Shiite comparable genre, and, and this was uh, a way of, re of recognizing that Shiites are different from Sunnis, they have their own tradition, and it should look different. It should not be simply similar to the way that the Sunnis operate. Um, then in the last chapter, I did an overall comparison of the Shiite uh, legal madhab uh, as it has developed and the Sunni legal madhabs. I pointed out a number of similarities between them. One is arguments for the authority of the jurists, you know, arguments by citing scriptural texts, uh, uh, verses from the Quran, um, and, uh, and hadith reports in order to argue that, that the jurists are the ones who are exclusively uh, have the prerogative to decide legal questions. Um, Another aspect that was very similar is the curriculum, the, just like the Sunnis developed in each madhab a legal curriculum, the Shiites developed a legal curriculum that in many ways looks the same, and in many of the parts of the curriculum involves reading the same texts. Then uh, the, um, okay. What else? All right, that they uh, end up getting a degree that in the Sunni medieval system is called Ijazat al ifta wa Tadris, the per certificate to give legal opinions and to teach law.
This comes to be known in later Shiite uh, tradition, starting probably in the 19th century, maybe even at the end of the 18th century. It was called Ijazat al-Ijtihad, the Certificate of, of Ijtihad. And overall, that the argument was that the institution looks quite similar and functions in a quite similar way. There are some differences, and the main difference has to do with the source of economic support. In the Shiite tradition, the uh, tax, or so an income tax called the Homs, was the main driver behind the uh, economic support of the legal establishment, whereas in Sunni societies it was mainly endowments right, that were the economic support of the institution. This has caused some differences between the various histories of, of um, the legal institution in Sunni as opposed to Shiite societies. In most Sunni modern countries, the government uh, took over all of the waqf establishment and so that the uh, uh, the Juris institution became folded into the government and part of a ministry in the government, whereas the Shiite institution tended to be much more independent of the government because their source of income was quite different. Right? Now, it has been about 20 years since, I, since this book came out. Uh, we know a few more things than we did uh, when, when I wrote the book. There's some specifics that we know more about, um, such as, for example, we know some more about Asharif al Murtada. Okay. Um, there, are, there are a number of other topics that, that are related to the book in which one could expand research. One is to look at this entire history for uh, the entire parallel history of the Zaydi Shiites. The Zaydi Shiites clearly developed uh, their own legal madhab over time and were reacting to many of the same pressures and many of the same kinds of things happened. That story hasn't been told because uh, there has been quite much, uh, much less scholarship on the Shiites. I would like to uh, explain in the future uh, many more of the details about the specific influences of works from the Shafi'i tradition on the Shiite legal tradition. And there, uh, I would like to explain more about the specific history of the, the justifications for the authority of jurists in Shiite history. The main answer that we get when we ask about the authority of jurists is that the jurists are now na'ib am. They're general representatives of the imam, and this is based on several hadith reports. That doesn't, we only have a clear statement of that from the 16th century, and there are other statements that, that I think should be um, investigated from earlier times and also developments in later times that have to do with other ways of justifying the authority of jurists. Thank you.